Okay, let's get started. Good morning. You're here. There's nothing to be here for other than knowledge for its own sake. The essays are in. You're done with Aristotle. There's nothing left, but here you are. Come to listen to the final of our lectures on Aristotle. So good for you. See, that's the nobility of learning. Not learning to pass some test, but learning for... It's your Philo Aristotelians is what you are. A love of Aristotle. Okay. So, Philo Aristotelians. Uh, last time we were here to, together, we were talking about Aristotle and his conception of the citizen. You may remember that we consider this question of the good man versus the good citizen. And we observed then that the distinction between the good man and the good citizen is that the good man, as Aristotle defines it, the excellence of the individual is about the sort of things that we ourselves can do, whereas our excellence as a citizen is derived from the relationship or what he calls the partnership that's created between us as the citizen and the state. And since the state can take on any number of forms, therefore there are any number of forms of citizenship, all of which would then be have their own version of good. And so as a result, he says that the good man is not necessarily the good citizen. However, based on what we're calling a normative politics, Aristotle's normative politics, meaning the politics that we should practice, that sort of distinction between the good man and the good citizen sets up, in a way, the normative reading that Aristotle offers us. Because the best politics, therefore, it's just a matter of straightforward logic, the best politics is therefore the <coughs> politics where the good man and the good citizen are co-equal, right? They are the same. And so what we should strive to do, and let's recall that we're operating in the world of what we're discussing as Aristotelian pragmatism, politics not as a utopian exercise, but politics as an art that can be acquired, learned, practiced, that therefore the aspiration of any political system is to get to the best possible state that it can be, Given the circumstances, he's a realist, he understands that there are limits on the kinds of politics that you can practice, but ultimately the goal should be the politics you, best, you most want to have is the politics that links then the quality or the excellence of the citizen and the excellence of the individual. As we discussed at the end of our class last time, the principles that he elaborates behind this kind of normative political vision are several. And we observed first that in Aristotle's sort of conception that the founding or the fundamental idea of a normative politics is that it be constitutional, that what he calls true politics is necessarily constitutional. It's an agreed upon set of rules. So the idea is it's the rule of law, the idea that you have a constitutional state, another way of saying that, is a state that's characterized by law. Uh, you also recall Aristotle argues in a true state, in a true government, that the government is the law. You may recall that he defines then the state or the government as the magistracy, as the system of law that exists. So when we think about all the different possible forms of government, all the different ways that you can sort of organize political affairs, for Aristotle there are true and untrue forms. And the true forms then redound to this idea of constitutionalism, that we have to have embedded in our political society a set of rules. That's the sort of basic, uh, the basic idea. Within that idea of constitutionalism, of course, there are any number of kinds of governments that we can practice, and he sets a kind of a boundary, we, call, we talked about it at the end of our last class, sort of two extremes. And at one extreme, we had rule by the elite, which we would call oligarchy or aristocracy, so the rule by a small number of people who arrogate themselves by virtue of their elite status in society, power and authority. And at the other extreme, we have the rule by the many, by the demos, by the people, a form of government that we then refer to as democracy. And these then represent the two possible extremes of the true forms of government, for both an oligarchy and a democracy, indeed, can be constitutional. So constitutional, constitutionalism is a necessary but not sufficient form for the best form of government because there are many kinds of government that you can have within a constitutional framework, but the best government is the one that avoids the errors of either of these extremes. And you may recall that we, I'll read the passage again very briefly, you may recall that the issue about rule by elite or rule by the many was that neither satisfies what Aristotle sees as the central ability to exercise power in a responsible way. He says the problem with this issue of oligarchs or the masses ruling, he says it's an evil which begins at home. 
And we noted for the, the very beginning of the Aristotelian discussion is the politics of the household. So we see how the politics of the household becomes then the politics of the state. The evil begins at home for when they are boys by reason of the luxury in which they are brought up. He's referring here to the elites. They never learn, even at school, the habit of obedience. Why was obedience important? What must we learn to obey? The Constitution, right? For the Constitution is a set of rules that we must learn to obey. If you're part of the elites, you don't have that respect for the Constitution. On the other hand, the very poor who are in the opposite extreme are too degraded. So one learns never to obey and the other learns never to command. Whereas the good citizen or the best citizen is the person who learns both to obey and to command. It has both obedience and command as part of their excellence, as part of their skill set. And so from his point of view, these extremes, rule by the many, rule by the, the few, rule by the elites, do not provide stable forms of government therefore cannot be considered the best form of government. Under such systems, the best in the individual, the good man, will not necessarily be the good citizen. And so he looks for an alternative. He looks for, or he looks for a, a solution to, to this issue, and the answer is what he calls the politics of the middle. And in book four and book five, he lays out then this idea of a politics of the middle, the advantage of a politics run from the middle. We would call it today a politics of the middle class. Now, he notes, and I should observe, that this for Aristotle, as I said, is a normative form of politics, meaning it's the politics that we should practice. It's, we should acquire a skill of political thinking in order to allow us to achieve this. And one of the mandates of this book is to give us this skill because, as he observes, generally we lack it. As he says at 1296a, the middle form of government has rarely, if ever, existed and among a very few only. This is not a widespread form of political practice that we observe around us. It is an ideal form that we should strive to achieve. But it is not the utopianism of the republic. It's not engaging in these sort of crazy practices of splitting up families, distributing property, and the like. Instead, it is achievable. In order to achieve it, what must we learn? We must learn, then, the art of politics. I want to go through some of the arguments that he makes for why the middle form of government is uh, the best. And we'll talk about, for example, stability and some questions around property and stuff like that. And then at the end of our discussion, I want to consider a couple of things that he brings to our attention, which I think have striking resonance to a modern reader. I want to start out first with an observation that he makes about why the middle government is good. And it comes to this question of why the government is there. In a best system, the people who who exercise authority, they do so because they are custodians of the law. They respect the law, they are obedient to the law, and so therefore they see themselves as having a duty to carry out uh, or implement the law in the state. You may recall that he defines the citizen as those who share in the offices and honors of the state. By contrast, the problem with what he calls the democratic or oligarchical systems of government is that power is often not seen in that way. It doesn't come back to this duty to to be custodians of the law. Instead, as he says at 1296a lines 25 following, whenever the rich or the common people overwhelm the middle, draw the constitution in their own way, thus arises an oligarchy or a democracy. And then whichever side gets the better of the other, instead of establishing a just or popular government, regards political supremacy as the prize of victory. And the one party sets up an oligarchy and the other party sets up a democracy. In this context, when you have these two extremes, the elites and the masses, government is seen as a prize for winning a fight. You are in, you are in conflict between these two sets of interests, which cannot be reconciled. And when you attain victory, instead of seeing it as an opportunity to set up a government that is just for all of society, you look at it as a prize, and therefore you have license to rule on behalf of one or of the other group. Somewhat analogous in our modern society, if we have a right-wing government that's then replaced by a left-wing government, that what we find is that both governments will then seek to implement ideological ideas, the purpose of which is to punish one set of constituents and reward another set of constituents. If you can imagine, if you are in a system of government where you are constantly migrating between these two poles, those two extremes, a populist politics of the many and an, ex an elitist politics of the few, does that create stability in the state? And it's clear that if, if you're engaged in this kind of politics of factionalism, 
what you will find is that it doesn't create stability in the state because whenever one government takes over from another, they get down to the business of replacing all of the policies that the previous government implemented that they didn't like. For Aristotle, the best state is the stable state. And so the advantage of a politics of the middle is that it provides what a state most needs, namely stability. Stability is the important element in order to maintain constitutionalism. That you have a stability of rule of law reflected in a stability of the laws that you implement, and from that stability of politics, then you get the stability of the state. That's what he suggests is the most important. Let's take a look at some of the constituent elements of this, of, of what provides that kind of stability. I want to look at this question of property, because we recall that in the opening chapter, in, as part of the politics of the household, and I promised we'd come back to it, and here we are, that he includes not only the master-slave relationship, not only the husband-wife or parent-child relationship, but he also has this lengthy discussion of the art of acquisition, the way in which we should hold property. And what he emphasizes in that sort of discussion of the politics of the household is the importance to exercise what he calls moderation or temperance. We must be moderate in the way that we accumulate things. We shouldn't seek to acquire too much. And the reason for that is because if we acquire too much, if in other words, property is distributed unequally in the state, what does it tend to do? It tends to create this kind of factionalism. It ends up in, in a state where many have little and a few have a lot. And that then creates the potential for factionalism and for tension. And so we find across the book that he refers repeatedly to this idea that we must practice the sense of moderation in, in, in the distribution of wealth as a fundamental element of a politics of stability, that that's what creates a stable society. If we look at our own society, and we look at the nature of inequality, would it be very Aristotelian? I think the answer is no, because as you're probably aware, or if you're not, you should be, a very small number of people control the vast majority of the wealth. Something like 10% of our society controls something like 90% of the available capital wealth. And the bottom 20%, or in some societies like Spain or the United States, even the bottom 40%, actually have no wealth at all. They are net debtors, right? They actually owe money. They have no net positive capital position. This is the kind of situation that for Aristotle is extremely dangerous because it creates a built-in incentive for those who have less to want to rise up and take it from those who have more. They don't necessarily have to do it through armed rebellion. They might do it through a modulation or an inflection of government. But the point is, then you have this constant competition that's taking place inside the state where one group is voting for one set of interests to take away from the other. And this is what creates then this back and forth, this instability, this factionalism, this dynamism or tension that exists inside, uh, inside the state. And so if we're looking then for a stable state, we want to avoid that kind of seesaw effect, that kind of factionalism and the like. This is why he argues it's not only that we should rule from the middle class, not just that we need a politics of the middle. In order for us to rule from the middle, what do we need? What's the precondition to ruling from the middle? We need a healthy middle class. So in a way, the best state actually reflects an ordering of what today we would call its economic affairs. Those states are best which actually create a healthy middle class. He says at 1295b, uh, it is manifest that the best political community is formed by citizens of the middle class and that those states are likely to be well administered in which the middle class is large and stronger than both the other classes. We should look to organize our affairs not to create or to concentrate power at the top or essentially strip people of power from the bottom, but instead to build up a solid, prosperous middle. And if we can do that, then we'll be able to build out a politics of the middle class. If you are unable to create this kind of politics of the middle, what happens? And this is where we get into a number of questions that are addressed in book five. This is the question of what he calls revolution. He says, we will consider the causes of revolution in states and of what nature they are, what modes of destruction apply, and the like. And he notes that there are a number of causes of revolution. When you think of revolution, what do you think of? What comes to mind? Change. Change? How does it take place? What does it look like? It gets violent and So the point about revolution is, don't necessarily think people taking to the streets, armed, 
fomenting some kind of violent change. Revolution can also be any underlying threat to the stability of the government. So when Aristotle talks to us about the causes of revolution, he's not only referring to some kind of armed, uh, armed rebellion or the like. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these uh, forms of revolution that he talks about, and I want to look at a, a few of them. Um, he actually mentions four, uh, and it's worth, I think, going, going through them. The first one, the first that he mentions is what he calls the desire for equality. When men think that they are equal to others, have more than themselves, or again, the desire for inequality and superiority. The motives for making them are the desire for gain and honor or the fear of dishonor and loss. The authors of them want to divert punishment or dishonor from themselves or the friend. They want to either gain something or, or take something that's bad and push it away. Equality can be, in this sense, not just an unequal distribution of property, although that's certainly part of it, but it can also then be the unequal distribution or perceived unequal distribution of rights, or as he says, of honors. He says another cause of revolution is fear, uh, that they are afraid of being punished, and so they will rise up against the government, which argues then against a government implementing laws that are too draconian. You do not want to create a society that is instilled with fear. I need to point out, because we'll come back to this question again, that this refers to people who are afraid of the government that has power over them. There's another form of fear that Aristotle talks about, but this is a fear of being punished by the government. And so essentially you might argue that it's an argument against internal repression. That state, well-constituted states need to be states that do not maintain power as a result of fear. Another one he says is they spring from what he calls a disproportionate increase in any part of the state. For as a body is made up of many members and every member ought to grow in proportion so that symmetry may be preserved, but it loses its nature if the foot is too long and the rest of its body too short. What does that mean? That means if the balance of your society becomes too distorted, therefore you might find people rising up. The, the politics that you have needs to reflect the balance of the society that you have within it. And finally, he says, another cause of revolution is difference of races, which do not at once acquire a common spirit. That is an interesting statement. If he had simply said another cause of revolution is difference of races, full stop, we would argue that Aristotle was advancing a racial definition of the state, that an ethnic definition of the state, that only those who have a certain ethnicity, or that the state is contiguous or coterminous with an ethnic identity. But that's not what he says. He says, another cause of revolution is difference of races which do not at once acquire a common spirit. What does he mean, do you think, by that idea of common spirit? What's another way of maybe saying that? Common identity. identity values, priorities, and the like. Can we think of any example today in front of us where we see unrest or disquiet or political turbulence that's being created as a consequence of what he calls a difference of races which do not at once acquire a common spirit? Look at what the political issue was that explains Brexit. What made Brexit such an important issue? What were the British people afraid of? People coming in from where? from outside, from places like Afghanistan, from India, from places like this, right? Or look at Holland, for instance, or look at Germany, where you see political movements, or look at France with the Front National. Who is the enemy in the eyes of the Front National? The immigrants. the immigrants, right? And what makes the immigrants so bad? Even if you're like the most rabid, radical person of the Front National, do you think someone from Morocco should simply be shot for being a Moroccan? No. What's the problem of having all these immigrants coming into France? It's that they do not become what? French. They, they lack the ability to become French. Or if you're in Holland and you see people coming in from, say, the Muslim, from, say, Indonesia, and they bring with them Indonesian attitudes. The problem is not who they are as people. It's perfectly fine to be Indonesian. The problem is it's not fine to be what? Indonesian in Holland. Because the Dutch uh, culture, country, is built around the premise of a certain, what Aristotle is calling us, common spirit, or what we would say common culture, common values. So what Aristotle is saying is, if you want to maintain political stability, you should be very careful about allowing people to come into your state. And here we might say that the key element is assimilation. We need to have ways so that the people who we bring in can learn to become like the people who are already there. It's not an argument against using racial or ethnic difference 
to exclude people from the state. Instead, it's an argument for having instruments of assimilation that can include people in the state. And what does he tell us? He says, if you cannot include or assimilate people that are coming in from the outside, you will have instability. What is an example of instability? It is political parties like the Front National or the Alternative for Deutschland or similar kinds of populist right-wing parties that then want to reject the status quo because they see it as going against or inimical to the common interest. And so from Aristotle's perspective, these are the kinds of things that people who are practicing politics well, people who have studied politics, need to understand and to think about because if you don't, what might happen is the stability of your state Will, will be challenged, right? will be compromised. And so therefore, in order to prevent these kinds of revolutions, the best way to do it is to have these policies, these politics of the middle. You want to have a politics that's in the hands of the combination of what he calls quantity and quality, which he mentions at 1296b. Every city is composed of quality and quantity. Quality means freedom, wealth, education, good birth, and quantity, <coughs> superiority of numbers. And so the best state is that which combines quality and quantity, and if you can achieve that, then you will be able to implement a kinds of politics that allows you to reach for stability. Let's take a look at some of the remedies he has to, to these sources of instability. We find them in book five, and we've seen a few of them already. One of them that we saw was that well-constituted states, well-constituted governments, should be very careful about constantly interfering with the rule of law. Remember that if the principle of a well-organized state is the principle of obedience, it's important then that the thing you are obeying remain stable. If it's constantly changing, that, I that idea of obedience becomes degraded, as he, as he remarks. He says at 1307b, I have already remarked that in all states, revolutions are occasioned by trifles. The citizens begin by giving up some part of the Constitution, and so with greater ease, the government change something else which is a little more important until they have undermined the whole fabric of the state. If we start by changing little things, we acquire or we learn that in fact these kinds of incremental changes can happen, and we start to advocate for more and more change. And so instead of trying to work out our differences in the context of an existing set of rules, we're constantly trying to improve things by changing the rules under which we live. And if we're constantly changing the rules, eventually, as he says, we undermine the very uh, stability of the state. If the state gets undermined, eventually, from Aristotle's perspective, it moves away then from this balance in the center and migrates to one of these two extremes, into oligarchy or back to democracy. And the problem there for Aristotle, and again, he anchors this by reference to numerous real-world examples, or real-world in his time, is that once you are back in this oligarchical or democratic form of government, that in fact it is easy to slip from there into a tyranny, where it's no longer a government of constitution, but a government of, of populism or a government of a sort of strongman, a caudillo. And once you've ended up there, you're no longer in a true form of government, right? Because you've now set aside the fundamental rules that government needs to, uh, needs, needs to live. So what's, one thing is then that we, in order to maintain stability, we need to ensure that we maintain respect for law uh, and respect for the underlying constitutional elements. As he says at 1307b, in all well-balanced governments, there is nothing which should be more jealously maintained than the spirit of obedience to law, more especially in small matters, for transgression creeps in unperceived and at last ruins the state, just as the constant recurrence of small expenses in time eats up a fortune. It's important to stop people from speeding on the highway, even though it may seem like a relatively minor offense, because those small transgressions reinforce the need to remain obedient to our rules. In other words, we need to maintain uh, vigilance over the small infractions, lest small, less small infractions become large infractions. There's another one that I wanted to consider, but I want to jump to the one that he says is most important that I'm going to come back, which he mentions at 1309, uh, 1308b and 1309a. He says, above all, this is again talking about the uh, sources or means of maintaining stability inside the state. He says, above all, every state should be so administered and so regulated by law that its magistrates cannot possibly make money. Government should not be seen as a form of self-enrichment. Government offices are not a form of emolument. In oligarchies, meaning amongst elites, 
Special precautions should be used against this evil, for the people do not take any great offense at being kept out of the government. Indeed, they are rather pleased than otherwise at having leisure for their private business. But what irritates them is to think that their rulers are stealing the public money. Then they are doubly annoyed, for they lose both honor and profit. When we see things like the Gürtel Affair, is that if we see politicians who are essentially exchanging their political influence for cash, what does that do to our perception of politics? It corrupts it, right? How do we then see our politicians? Do we see them as honorable people? No. And is it not true that most of us think that politicians are not honest actors acting out of some kind of noble desire to achieve the greatest good? Instead, how do we tend to see politicians as who? Liars. Liars, thank you. Be honest, what else do we see them as? Demagogues. Demagogues, do they believe what they say? Are they sincere? No. They're two-faced, they're silver-tongued. Are they in it for noble reasons? Why are they in it? Self-interest. Self-interest. They're in it for the power and for the money. This is how we see our political classes. Now, think about it. Is that actually true? Do you think every single member of the political class is some two-faced, hypocritical, insincere, power-hungry, money-grabbing, egotistical maniac? No. No. Yet, as soon as you join the ranks of the political classes, this is how you are seen. (laughs) This is how you are seen. Why is it that you are seen that way? Because the interference of money inside the political system doesn't just corrupt those who would seek to use or turn their office into a form of emolument. They degrade the whole system so that even the person who is honest and sincere and genuinely does have an interest in fighting for the common good gets painted with the same brush. All politicians are corrupt. All politicians are insincere. All politicians are simply looking out for themselves. When Aristotle tells us then that above all, every state should be so administered and so regulated by law that its magistrates cannot possibly make money. He's not arguing simply that it's important that we have people who are not corrupt in the office. It's that the capacity for the political system to be leveraged in a way that it turns into an attenuated form of emolument actually undermines people's confidence in the political system itself. It says what irritates them is to think that the rulers are stealing the public money for they lose both honor and profit. Your money being diverted to illegitimate ends and therefore you feel that the government or that those who practice politics are not honorable. If office brought no profit, then and then only could democracy and aristocracy be combined for both notables and people might have their wishes gratified. All would be able to hold office, which is the aim of democracy, and the notables would be magistrates, which is the aim of aristocracy. And this result may be accomplished when there is no possibility of making money out of the offices, for the poor will not want to have them, because they're not rich enough to be able to take up a job full-time that doesn't pay anything, and the notables will not want to be governed by the lower class, and so they will be willing to take up the position. Essentially, he's arguing political offices should be voluntary. The point is that we should be keenly aware of the role of peculation in politics. 